So, Mark Cook, please. So, I gather the, this, several of you I, I know are quite knowledgeable about Latin America and about Venezuela in particular. So, you, if you want to have any, if you have any specific questions in, in some obvious, you know, well-informed or critical question, whatever you, whatever you want to clarify, anything that, about what's been happening lately or something like that, we could certainly go into that. I know that, that you gave a good discussion and that William had called in and he gave a good discussion of some of the problems. So it would be fine if, you know, if people want to discuss those things as well. Um, I should say that um, I was, one of the people who we met, his name is uh, Luis Tavera, and he works for Telesur, and was eager to meet with more of us, and he um, wanted me to be on television, this was the night before last, just to discuss media lies about Venezuela, which, I mean, I had written a major piece in, in For Fairness and Accuracy and Reporting For Fair on that, and um, so he wanted to do that, and we were going to be on for 15 minutes on this regular show um, where um, the host, whose name is Tatiana, she's Colombian, but she's lived in, in Venezuela for some time. She was going to have it on for 15 minutes just discussing media lies. But then our um, moral guardians in Washington decided that that would be the night to attack the Venezuelan embassy. And they broke the locks and so on. And so the whole show was half of it going up there. And we couldn't have asked for something better. Instead of it being 15 minutes, it went on for the full hour and a half. And at the end, she said, Tatiana said, this is a gift from the gods. I mean, how could they be this stupid? We thought that they couldn't possibly top their buffoonish coup d'etat on the 30th of April, but it seems they have. And uh, what could they have been thinking? We talk about own goal after own goal after own goal when they are, the, the four people who have been arrested will now come out as heroes, will be going on a national tour, speaking at, in the towns and <laughs> universities, and, and, and you couldn't have, we couldn't have asked for a better build-up for them if, if we had tried. Why they did this, considering this wasn't something they did on the spur of the moment, they've had this going on now for weeks to discuss this. And we think of the number of times, you know, sometimes there will be an attack on an embassy by a mob, and there will be criticisms of the host government for having failed to provide adequate police protection or something like that. And that, that's somehow a violation of the Geneva, uh, of, of, of the Vienna Accords on this and the Vienna Conventions. But I have never heard of a case where the police, and in this case the police and the Secret Service, are the ones who've attacked the embassy. And the, the, the hilarious part of this was when one of them, one of the Guaido, Guaido's gang said, that they were going to check to see what damage had been done by the four people inside, the, the, la the last of the ones who remained inside once the water and food was shut off. They didn't, I guess, want to have too many people uh, because of the demand on water and food. Um, they were going to see what damage had been done to the embassy. Well, how would these people know, these fine gentlemen? What, what, what They've never been in the embassy. For the last 20 years, the embassy has obviously been in the hands of their adversaries. So uh, at least, you know, so the idiocy of this whole operation, mm -hmm. you, you really can't make this kind of stuff up. And we saw this happening all the way through. When the coup happened on the 30th of April, I got a note urgently in the morning from a friend in Nicaragua saying that he was reading uh, that there had, was a coup d'etat taking place in Caracas. And I looked out the window, everything seemed to be fine. The, the turn on the TV, the pro-government TV stations are on the air. That's a pretty clear evidence that the coup is a flop. If, if the <laughs> gang that's running the coup can't even remove its adversaries' TV shows, programs from and, and, and stations from the air, then things are really badly wrong. And then just walking out on the street and seeing people, you know, large numbers of people were walking through the streets on their way to work or on their way to class. And this was even a more ridiculous colla collapse than all of the other ones they've had up until now. They started with the coup in, in 2002 which did succeed for 36 hours. Uh, and the New York Times, if you go back and read what they wrote, extolling Pedro Carmona as this mild-mannered businessman who uh, was uh, an expert at conciliation and working, bringing people together and so on. This is the guy who within hours after that Times 
article, it wasn't an editorial, they had an editorial as well, uh, praising him, but, but an article, you know, praising him in this way, within hours he was announcing that they were going to abolish the parliament, they were going to uh, um, abolish, you know, obviously the president and the vice president and all the other people in the, uh, who would follow on that. As with the United States, you have the president, the vice president, as here the speaker of the house or, you know, the president of the National Assembly, as it would be called, the leader of the uh, parliamentary majority in the parliament, then the head of the Supreme Court and, and on down. And obviously they weren't going to allow any of those people to be president because they were all Chavistas and they had no desire to have any of them. Uh, and he remained, and, and, and this, uh, ab abolishing the judiciary, the, the entire, all the courts, not just the Supreme Court, but all of the courts, <laughs> all the way down, abolishing the legislature for a, a newspaper that has been going around claiming that that Maduro or Chavez were making an assault on the separation of powers and so on. Well, there wasn't any separation of powers with Carmona. He had abolished those other two powers mm -hmm. and set up what could only be called a totalitarian dictatorship. It was embarrassing. There's one of those days when the, the New York Times and the, the, the Times of London and El Pais in Madrid, um, which was also, both, both of them were also extolling the coup, it's one of those days when the circulation department wants to call, pick up the phone and call their trucks and say, can you get those, get those trucks out and get those newspapers back and say, oh, that was a wrong edition. Uh, this, is, this is the newer edition or something like that. It was one of those days. And it was so humiliating afterward, uh, once they had written this nonsense. And the, head, the, the character who wrote the article for El Pais is now the, head of, is the editor of Foreign Policy magazine in Washington Whoa. and presenting himself as some great Democrat in favor and so on. Um, the, the ludicrousness of their claims to be in favor of uh, democracy, in favor of any kind of mm -hmm. constitutional rule at all, uh, and, and what's the silliest part is when they claim that the, um, the economy is a mess and it's all Maduro's fault. Mm -hmm. Well, if it's all Maduro's fault, then would you please, would you gentlemen please tell us, why do you find it necessary to impose the sanctions? Exactly. And, and if you want to prove that it's all Maduro's fault, why don't you lift the sanctions? Give them and they're more proved. They're a complete hash exactly. of the place exactly. themselves. Why don't you let them show yes. that? Uh, in, instead, this is the clearest evidence that this is entirely brought on by uh, a, a completely artificial crisis. Yes, they had the collapse of oil prices in 2016, which hit all oil exporting countries. But the government made a pretty good recovery from that. Now they are under this extreme squeeze, with yes. a, a chokehold really, yeah. Uh, imposed by the uh, by the U.S. authorities. As far as why uh, their whole claim is, well, we have all of these countries, over 50 countries. Yeah, well, that leaves quite a large number, uh, a huge majority, who are not uh, supporting uh, Guaido and so on. Virtually all of Asia, virtually all of Africa. One one country in Africa, Morocco, has gone along with the Guaido line, uh, supporting Guaido. One country <laughs> in Asia, one. Israel. For those who've forgotten that Israel is in Asia, you know, there you've got the proof. That's it. And they don't even have um, everybody in Europe, Italy, Norway, Greece, they've all, re NATO par partners, partners have refused to go along with this. I so it was, yeah. it was a NATO, it was a NATO operation, but they weren't able to, Norway has maintained the position that it wants to be able to be a negotiator, you know, and try to settle things. Watch the same position that Mexico and Uruguay and so on have maintained in Latin America. And Germany changed midstream. Yeah. Germany yeah. originally recognized Guaido uh -huh. and then backed and away. Then backed away. Yeah. Well, it's becoming increasingly clear that this is a Thank horse you. that won't run, and why are you throwing more money at it? I mean, it, it, it obviously isn't going to anywhere. Because it's our money. I'm sorry? Because it's our money. Yeah, exactly, yeah. yeah. Uh, but this has been a, 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 an utter fiasco, and the the fact that it was the, the morning of the coup, of this latest coup, the April 30th coup, they were claiming that this was their big moment, that this was going to be the, the moment when they were going to really, if, if this was their big moment, and they couldn't even get anybody in, the, in a base, I was just talking there at the mission just now, at the Nicaraguan mission, to the Japanese television crew that was in, Caracas was and was called urgently to La Carlota military base early in the morning. They were there very early and they found out. They were the ones who reported what actually happened. The 
soldiers and some you know, mid-level officers, captains, majors, so on, were lured into what they thought was a completely separate, uh, some other event altogether. Mm -hmm. They got there and found out that they were meeting with Guaido and Leopoldo Lopez, who was this extreme right-wing figure from the old mm -hmm. oligarchy, and they r escaped, most of them, and ran into the base, whereupon Guaido got out there with a bullhorn and ordered them all to come out and hand over the base to him, which of course they obviously didn't do. And they got nobody this time, at least in the 2002 coup, they had a large, quite a number of senior military officers. And you would have thought that, okay, they exposed themselves, so Chavez knew who they were, knew who his friends were, and he knew who his enemies were, so he could get them out. Now it's another generation. That was yes. 2002, this is 2019. Yes. Um, and now they have a whole new generation of people. You would have thought they would have gotten somebody to join the coup. They got nobody. Huh. And, the, and the fact that they have, um, they were banking on, first of all, they thought that they had three senior military officers, including the defense minister himself. And they had some reason to believe that. He had, um, Padrino had been the, had been trained at the School of the Americas here in the United States. And he had uh, two children who were born here and have American passports. So they thought he was on, they wouldn't be on their side. They neglected to consider that he's been a, a Chavista all the way through. Um, and the same with the others. And they, and, and it, nothing that has ever happened. They, uh, apparently, they led them along in believing that they were going to support their operation in order to find out who the, who the people involved in the plot were. And it was a complete fiasco, and now, within hours, poor Leopoldo Lopez, who had been under house arrest, or not house arrest, um, casa por carcel, a house for prison. I mean, he lives in his own home, um, but, you know, is under some sort of house arrest. Um, he was living in comfort there. He had a great big, you know, like, very fancy house with his wife and, and daughter. Um, now he's living in a much more confined space in the Spanish embassy. Um, so this was hardly a, a, an ideal setup for him. And why, are, why can't they get anything right? I mean, what is wrong with their analysis here? And I, I, I can't think of anything except the fact that they feel themselves to be the legitimate governing class of the country. Mm -hmm. Lopez traces his ancestry all the way back to the founders of the country, Simon Bolivar himself. He has some, <laughs> he claims, pure, as they all do, from all over Latin America, the pure Spanish blood, pure European blood, which isn't the case. I mean, Simon Bolivar was not pure Spanish blood, <laughs> but mostly anyway. And, and that they have these foreign contacts, usually uh, university educations abroad. In the case of both Leopoldo Lopez and some of the others, they've been educated in the I, in Ivy League business schools, um, and and they act as if they are the rightful governors of the country. They ridicule Maduro for being a, a bus driver, and you know it's true he was a bus driver and the head of the bus drivers union, and then he was the um, the foreign minister and a very effective foreign minister. He was widely well regarded by the Obama administration in Washington, and he was. You know, president of the National Assembly and the, and the vice president, um, and but after he was accused of being a bus driver, he took to you know coming to every political gathering he he went to and driving a bus. Um, <laughs> it's they don't seem to understand that this doesn't work, that that they believe that this should work, mm -hmm. and they talk about you and know it's their not degrees. An Mm -hmm. To say somebody's a bus driver, exactly. they assume, everybody would assume that a bus driver is stupid yeah. and that he doesn't deserve to ever be president. And, and you can turn that around. Yeah. Can you ever imagine a bus driver become president of the United yeah. States? Yeah. Exactly. I mean, just think of that. What money it takes to become. I mean, yeah. the whole thing of the bus driver symbol, I think, is wonderful yeah. because yeah. it teaches so much about they, they, the They contrast. call him a worker president, that right. he represents the workers. Um, in some ways, I mean, these people are responding in some of the ways that I think maybe this can be explained to a larger American audience saying, this is not all that different from the New Deal. I mean, the things that they have tried to bring in are not that different. And they responded the same way. Remember the DuPont family and others tried a, a military coup d'etat in 1934. Mm -hmm. It's all been pushed up, but, but Smedley Butler, the most decorated American military officer of the day, revealed it, that they had approached him and wanted him to pull this coup. And he's the one who said that he was the gangster for big business and, and, and so on. Um, but he 
revealed all this, and of course they said, oh, it was all misunderstanding, he couldn't, but they couldn't really call him a liar or anything, he was the most de de decorated, you know, military of, the, of, of his day, but it was all, you know, kind of hushed up. But it's very similar, the kind of, the old gang who really think that they should be, you know, rightfully ruling the place, and they can't seem to understand that it's a new, in a world has happened. And speaking on that connection to American politics, it occurred to me that there are certain similarities. If you want to, if you're speaking to a larger American audience, um, Chavez died in 2013. He was replaced by Maduro, who was he had been a very talented foreign minister and so on, but he'd never run for office, and he was kind of wooden and maladroit, and he was running against. Enrique Capriles, who was a very uh, experienced, he'd run for governor, been elected governor of a state and so on. Um, and it came close. It wasn't as close as they claim at all. It was um, Maduro defeated Capriles in that election in 2013 by well over twice the margin that Obama defeated Mitt Romney the year before. Mitt, Obama got 0.7% margin of victory. Uh, Maduro got 1.8%, so well over twice that. So it's not anything close. But I was thinking of the comparisons. In 1945, Roosevelt died and Truman became president and it was immediately a huge disappointment to a lot of Democrats. And he had not been a New Dealer um, and he was ridiculed as knowing nothing about economics. And within a very short time, a public opinion poll in the United States said that more Americans trusted Republicans to run the economy than Democrats for the first time since the Great Crash in 1929 and the Great Depression. And this is a big surprise. And then in 1946, the Republicans gained a working two-thirds majority in both houses of Congress. They had, it both, it both had been in the hands of the Democrats up until then. And with that, and including with Dixiecrats in the South, they were able to overrule Truman's veto of the Taft-Hartley bill, which really cut away dramatically at the at gain, labor gains in the at one in the New Deal. So this, that, that was in 46. In 48, Truman is running for president against an experienced candidate, you know, Thomas Dewey, who had been the candidate in 1944 as well against Roosevelt, governor of New York. And Truman defeats him, and it wasn't any squeaker at all. It was by four and a half percentage point margin. Now, if that had happened in Venezuela, everybody would say, well, obviously the election was a fraud. I mean, how could it be otherwise? The Democrats were split three ways. The Dixiecrats in the South were supporting Strom Thurmond. The left of the Democrats were supporting Henry Wallace and the Progressive Party. So how could it, and Truman was not a very well-liked figure, and Truman defeated Dewey by more, by a, a greater margin than Roosevelt had defeated Dewey in four years earlier, in 1944. How could this possibly be? Roosevelt was well-liked, Truman was not. So this obviously was a complete fraud. And what had he done? What had Truman done to make this happen? Well, he, he moved very, very sharply to the left from the time he was nominated. Go back and watch his speech you can see it on the internet now at the Democratic National Convention. And he really moved sharply to the left to try to recover the votes that were otherwise going to go to, to Henry Wallace. And most of them did come back to Truman. People said, do we really want Thomas Dewey to be president of the United States? And they decided they didn't. So, uh, and so he recovered that. By the, by the end, when it was quite cold and I think in Albany, at the end of October, beginning of November, they had 25,000 people waiting to hear Truman speak when his train rolled through in Albany, New York. 25,000 people. And the, the media at the time just wrote that off as ridiculous. I mean, obviously, Truman was going to lose the election. We all knew that. And, of course, the Chicago Tribune went to bed saying that defeat, Dewey had defeated Truman. And he did, Dewey didn't even carry uh, Illinois, the Chicago Tribune's home state. But, but that was, it would have, all of this would have been used as evidence that, that the election, if it had happened in, in, in Venezuela, the election was obviously a fraud. And, and yet, that's what they can do and what they have been able to do. They are able to point to the economic problems created by the U.S. authorities and by the oligarchy, but especially now by the U.S. authorities, and they can point to it and say this is, this is, what's, this is who's causing it and so on. And even in right-wing circles now, there's a professor at Amherst who's very right-wing, uh, anti-Chavista, he may be Venezuelan originally, um, and he has been saying, even in the pages of the New York Times, that you know these sanctions don't usually work any more than bombing usually works. It usually unites the population around the government, as happened in the Blitz in London, happened with 
support for the Nazis and, and the Japanese government and, and with the bombing of those countries. Happened, and it's happened over and over again with sanctions. Sanctions unite people, they can point, and, and there's a also, we're all, you know, sharing in sacrifice, we're all, you know, sharing in, in this hard time and it's all the fault of the enemy and so on. I'm fairly optimistic from what I was, what I saw this last time about how things are going. I was there a lot in 2016 when I was reading in Time magazine that there was no aspirin to be found anywhere in the country. So I walked out the door of my apartment to the nearest pharmacy four blocks away and found plenty of aspirin as well as plenty of ibuprofen and plenty of acetamine uh, and in and, and a well stocked, well, you know, you know, with an expert pharmaceutical staff. It would be the en an envy of any American drugstore. Uh, a few days after that time story, uh, CNBC carried a report there was no acetaminophen to be found, no Tylenol anywhere in the country. Well, that must have taken the uh, Pfizer Corporation by surprise because it was their subsidiary, Pfizer Venezuela SA, uh, that produced the acetaminophen that I bought. And it would go, but it went on like this. The, the Financial Times, which is usually thought to, well, it's a journal, the financial journal, but at least it's thought to be a fairly serious journal, they carried a story earlier. They picked the um, anniversary, actually, of the failed, the failed coup in 2002 um, on the 11th of uh, April 2016 to declare that the country was in chaos and civil war and was a failed state. So I asked right-wing right -wing friends of mine in, in Caracas, do you agree with this? And they said, well, no, of course, that's ridiculous, stating the obvious, no, there's no civil war and there's no chaos. Mm -hmm. But one of them said, it is a failed state because it's failing to provide all the medical needs of, for everybody in the country. Well, by that standard, every country in Latin America is a it's a failed state, and the United States as well. Exactly. So, you know, what, so this was, and, and what was interesting about all three of those articles, the, the Time, CNBC, and the Financial Times, was that none of those who wrote the articles was in the country, or even pretended to be, and there was actually no evidence that they ever had, had ever been in the country. Mm -hmm. And yet they're writing these, there's no, there's no limit to the kind of lies that they've been able to tell. Mm -hmm. And we saw the same thing in Nicaragua back in the 80s. I remember in 80, 1985, I was getting ready to leave for Nicaragua that day. I was in my New York apartment, and a, a friend of mine called for me for me in his job. He um, read the Wall Street Journal as soon as he got to work every morning. And he said that there was a report in the Wall Street Journal that morning that the Soviet Union was building a naval base in the Nicaraguan city of Esteli. And he said, I cannot believe the Sandinistas are this stupid. We're going to lose every friend we have in Washington. Nobody in Congress will talk to us. Reagan is sure to invade now. How could the, the Sandinistas be crazy? Well, on my way to the airport, I was thinking, wait a minute, how can you have a naval base in Esteli? There's no water in Esteli. But when I got to the airport and bought a copy of the Wall Street Journal, there was demanding to know whether it was true that the Soviet Union was secretly building a naval base in Esteli. Well, I didn't have anything to write with, but I bought a greeting card from a gift shop there, thinking of you, and wrote it to the editor of the Wall Street Journal, I said, just for your information, Esteli is a town in the mountains of Nicaragua. <laughs> as far as it's possible to get from either the Atlantic or the Pacific coast, as you can get anywhere in the country, or for that matter, from any significant internal body of water. So a naval base there would be a construction project on the scale of the Panama Canal, or perhaps even the Great Wall of China, and would be difficult to keep secret for very long. I said, don't you think it more likely that the Soviet Union is secretly building a naval base in Salt Lake City, Utah. I mean, at least that's on a body of water even if it would not go anywhere. Well, I don't know if they ever published the letter, but the next day they were back with a whole new pack of lies. I'm sure you are familiar with some of the lies they were telling, but even those lies were ta have been topped by the nonsense that's being published every day about Venezuela. Yep. Yes. So let me leave it at that, and, and I'm sure you'll have some comments or thoughts and other things I'd love to hear from you. Thank you. Well, I like your humorous interpretation <laughs> of the, the big lies, of the big lies, because it is pretty shocking. It, it never stops. I mean, we've had this, um, one of the silliest ones, I found, do we have to do this? I found myself taking photographs of dogs in the street, dogs in the street, not wild dogs, not anything, they're very friendly, obviously being cared for by somebody. They're not on a leash, but they're obviously being cared for by somebody. Why do I need to do this? 
Because there was a report that the Venezuelans are killing their dogs because they can't oh, afford yes. to oh, feed them. To As a matter of fact, them. they're eating the dogs because they're so hungry. Oh, and all the pictures that I got were dogs who seemed to be well fed and were obviously being cared for by somebody. So I took some photographs of this. Being, you can't make up you know, the latest lie because you never dream that they're going to come up with something that stupid, but they do. Can you, can you talk a little bit, you know, talking about lies, right? So one is the level of repression against the Venezuelan people. Can you talk about this? Yeah, um, this is, comes out as a lot of the so-called human rights reporting. Those who are going to use Amnesty International and Human Rights Watch um, as evidence, you know, to support their claims of some kind of repression of the population, really need to answer what those organizations have done in the past. In 1986, Amnesty International obediently turned out, the Re Reagan administration was trying to resume overt funding for the Contras, which of course was illegal and they were doing it secretly through the Iran uh, Contra scandal. So now they were trying to resume it, $100 million. And Amnesty dutifully came out with a report claiming uh, all kinds of things based on lies that were spoon-fed to them by right-wing groups in Nicaragua um, that were in the pay of the U.S. Embassy. Amnesty never confronted the Nicaraguan government with those charges or even discussed it with anybody in the press corps. We could all have shown them that these were a ridiculous pack of lies. And it was a very embarrassing. I wrote a report on this, responding to, the, to this Amnesty report for Envio, which was at the time was a pretty good publication, it's not so much any now, but it was a, it's a Jesuit publication, and it came out in six languages, so it was widely read in, in those circles. And a guy who saw it, who was a young lawyer, um, Paul Laverty, working for Scottish Medical Aid in Nicaragua, saw the report, took it back to Britain, and got it, got our response on the, in most of the major broadsheet newspapers in London and in Scotland, and how did he do this? I, how can you get the respectability to do this? Well, he did it was Amnesty and, and Human Rights Watch, or it was then known as American Watch, uh, had both come out with reports uh, obediently at the request of the Reagan administration. But the Amnesty report was much, much worse than the Human Rights Watch report. So he was use, able to use the Human Rights Watch report as a way to, as a stick essentially to beat, to beat the um, Amnesty report as a making the Human Rights Watch report his witness, as a lawyer would have the thinking to do. It didn't occur to me, but he, he did it, and he did it very effectively, and he got it on most of the leading papers in Britain and Scotland, and in England and Scotland, and on BBC Radio, BBC Television, BBC World Service. Paul Laverty, of course, has since gone on to becoming a famous screenplay writer with Ken Loach's films, including, I mean, I think they may have won the Cannes Award just this week. Um, but they won for The Wind That Shakes the Barley and a number of other famous films that they have done together. But at the time, he was working for Scottish Medical Aid in, in, um, in Nicaragua, and he, we, we just completely wrecked it. But it wasn't just the, the fact that they were printing these lies that were ludicrous. It was that they would hold Nicaragua up to a standard in wartime. They wouldn't hold their own country up to a mm -hmm. peace time. For example, Amnesty, there was a guy named... Um, Luis Roja, who was running a CIA-run radio station just over the border in Costa Rica that had an extremely powerful trans transmitter and it would reach virtually anywhere in, in Nicaragua. And he was arrested when he returned to Nicaragua at one point and Amnesty said that they hoped he wasn't being arrested for his journalistic activities and that they were considering making him a prisoner of conscience. So I wrote that this is amazing because unless you're planning to reopen the cases of Lord Haw Haw, Tokyo Rose, and Ezra Pound, and make them prisoners of conscience, prisoners of conscience in Amnesty's terms is limited to people who have not taken up arms or advocated the taking up of arms. And this radio station was advocating the taking up of arms and joining the Congress every single day. So. It's utterly ridiculous that they were putting this out. Um, the, it, that wasn't the only case of this kind of thing. I remember uh, there was a guy, Bertrand de Lagange, from Le Monde, 
and he, Lamone took a sharp turn to the right in about 1980, and he was widely considered in the press corps to be a CIA agent. So Baton de Lagrange comes, plunks himself down at a table, an outdoor restaurant we had there in, in Managua, and says that, uh, with two, there were two guys from the San Francisco Chronicle and me around the table, and he says, nobody in France wants anything to do with the with the Sandinistas, and even the Socialist Party wants nothing to do with them. Um, no, nothing. Um, any government that shuts down a newspaper cannot be called anything other than a totalitarian government. And I said, well, gee, that's interesting, because when I was a student in France in 1969, 1970, around there, your country's government closed down two newspapers, like Cause du Peuple, the, the Maoist newspaper, and Ebdel al Akhiri, a, a left-wing satirical journal. and. Um, and he said, oh, well, well, that was when we had that uh, uh, Poniatowski as the minister. Sorry. Yeah. We're just saying bye-bye to the... Oh, oh okay, sorry. Bye-bye, <laughs> thank you. Um, that was when we had Poniatowski as the minister of the interior. I said, no, no, Poniatowski had nothing to do with that. It was in a later government. De Gaulle, the president of France, took the decision to close La Cause du Peuple, the Maoist publication. Uh, and when Jean-Paul Sartre went into the street to sell the paper in protest, they didn't arrest Sartre. One does not arrest Voltaire, said de Gaulle. Um, but they did arrest anybody who bought the paper from him and was walking what? down the street with it. Yeah. Um, and so, Baton de Lagrange, the Le Monde reporter, says, uh, yeah, well, but these papers are of no importance at all. La Prensa here, which was suspended at that time, um, after the $100 million had been appropriated by the U.S. Congress, um, La Prensa is a very important paper here in Managua. And I said, well, yeah, precisely. Um, these two papers didn't represent any threat to French national security or the state security of the French government, much less was, were they being financed by a foreign power with a long history of invading France, overthrowing democratic governments in France, installing murder squad military dictatorships, and, and, and so on. And he said, well, but the, the Maoists were terrorists. I said, no, well, I'm not a Maoist, but the Maoists weren't terrorists. He said, oh, yes, he said, there was the case of Pierre Lavelny. And I said, Pierre Ovelny was a Maoist who was murdered by fascist terrorists. There was a huge demonstration, sort of a funeral cortege, but tens of thousands of people came out and marching through the streets of Paris in protest. But he wasn't a terrorist. So he it says, well, okay, maybe. And he's telling us one lie after another after another like this, to the point where the two guys from the San Francisco Chronicle and I began to wonder whether he really worked for Le Monde at all. But he pulled out his press card and showed us that indeed he did. And that was just one example of how you're holding a country up to a, a standard in wartime, when Nicaragua was obviously at war, and, and a war sponsored by the, the United States with a long history of making war on Nicaragua, um, which you don't hold your own country up to in peacetime. And it wasn't just them. The, uh, uh, some member of parliament from Holland came through. And he said, no country can be admitted to the community of civilized nations that closes a newspaper. I said, gee, that's fascinating because your country's government closed down the Telegraph after the war. It had been a fascist, a Nazi collaborator newspaper during the war. Um, and um, it remained closed for some years, and now it's back. It's resumed its position as a right-wing publication in Holland. And he was surprised. I wasn't sure whether he didn't know that or whether he didn't think that foreigners would know that or, or what. But these are cases of where you... Um, and what's interesting about all those cases, the Tokyo Rose, Ezra Pound, and Lord Haw Haw. Lord Haw Haw was hanged by the British. Lord, uh, Tokyo Rose was sent to a prison by the U.S. authorities, and, and Ezra Pound was sent to a lunatic asylum by the U.S. authorities. Um, and remained there for 12 years until a group of prominent Americans wrote to Eisenhower asking that he be released because they didn't want their country to be known as the country where a famous poet like Ezra Pound had died in a mental institution. So they, on Eisenhower, Eisenhower, as far as I know, was not a psychiatrist, but he ordered his release. So, and he got out and declared all America's insane and stomped off back to Italy. But, but all of these happened when the war was over and these, none of these people represented any threat to the national security, the state security of the government. Whereas the ones we're mentioning about Nicaragua and the ones here, most emphatic, and, and with, with Venezuela, most emphatically, they do represent a threat. Now, as far as the actual attacks, I mean, if you compare this with any country, this country, for example, but any other country in Latin America, you look at the kinds of, of murders that have gone on for years now in Mexico, 
you know, wholesale murder of political leaders it was the PRD, it's now other political left-wing parties who, without the slightest interest in investigating this by the Mexican authorities, it's going to be a commitment now by AMLO's government to try to investigate, but even he has not been able to resolve who killed the 43 school Students. teachers, nothing. And the same, of course, goes on wholesale in, in, in Brazil, it's happened wholesale in, in, in um, in, in, Honduras. Here you have Honduras. one of the members of the group, the, the Lima group, supposedly, you know, the countries that have ganged up, you know, the, the, the new coalition of the willing to make, you know, to attack uh, Venezuela. Mm -hmm. The Honduran government came to power in a coup d'etat mm -hmm. in, in 2009 with the oh. Obama administration. Hillary Clinton was the main person pushing that whole thing through. Um, and they've run through since the just murder squad regime murdering uh, environmental activists, human rights activists, news uh, journalists, uh, and they just held a completely fraudulent election. Remember that the, the justification for the coup in 2009. There was no democracy. Same thing. It, it was a, it was supposedly, same thing. that the that that Mel Zelaya, the president, was trying to change the constitution in order to be able to run for a second term. This was a complete lie. He wasn't planning to do anything of the of the sort. He was planning to hold a constitutional convention after he left office. Was holding a plebiscite whether people were interested in doing such a thing. But he was going to have left office long before. His own party had already nominated his successor, so there wasn't any question he was running again. Um, and he and the plan was to try to have a more democratic constitution than the one that w was and is in effect in in Honduras, which was put, imposed during the dictatorship of General Alvarez in the early 1980s. So it's it was just an effort at a constitutional and more, more democratic constitution. But ironically, now the president who has just elected himself in one of the most embarrassingly fraudulent elections has had run in complete violation. The, the justification remember, was he, that Zelaya wanted to change the Constitution. This guy didn't even bother to change the Constitution. He ran in violation of the Constitution for a second term in a ludicrously fraudulent election. And, and they're an honored member of the, of the Lima group, this, this gang of a bunch of right-wing puppet states. Um, the coup as I wrote on this at the time for FAIR, um, the coup in 2009 was an exact replica of the same coup that had been run 45 years earlier in 1964 in Brazil against the, government, the democratic government of Jean Goulart. Same pretext uh, that he was trying to change the constitution in order to be able to run for a second term. Everybody knew that was false, that the, the oligarchy and big business were uh, worried that his successor might be more left-wing than he than Goulart was, but um, that was it. The, the the Arthur Kroc, who was a columnist for the New York Times at the time, was shocked that they would consider trying to change the Constitution in order to run for a second term. A horrible thought. And the same, almost word for word, the same things they were writing in 2009 in the New York Times. They couldn't say that the that the opposition claimed or asserted that that Mezzali was trying to change the Constitution to this because it obviously was false. So with the classic Orwellian newspeak, you know, long favored by the New York Times, they said that they feared, the opposition feared that he might try to change the Constitution. Well, I mean, you can fear anything, right? You can fear <laughs> monsters in your bedroom closet. You can fear grizzly bears in the Sahara Desert. You, know, you can you know, fear anything. Right? Um, and that was the way that they ran the thing. But it was an exact copy, down to filling the streets with uh, gangs of people if you, we can now read the cables that the ambassador, Lincoln Gordon, was writing off to Washington in 1964, uh, the, Brazil, the U.S. ambassador to Brazil, asking for boatloads of money, first to bribe members of the Brazilian Congress, the Parliament, to turn against the president, and then to hire gang leaders to fill the streets with gangs to give the impression that it was popular support for the, for the coup. And you can go back and read Time Magazine and so on uh, about how enthusiastic, supposedly, the people of Brazil were out celebrating. In fact, one of the Newsweekies, I'm not sure whether it was Time or Newsweek, wrote that the number of people supporting, uh, filling the streets of Rio and Sao Paulo and other cities, celebrating the overthrow of the democratic government and the installation of a military dictatorship, the number of people who were out there celebrating that was greater, according to the Newsweekly, than the number of people who had two years earlier filled the streets of Rio to welcome home the Brazilian soccer team after it won the World Cup. Wow. 
allowing for some of these weaknesses, we things have a tendency to exaggerate a bit, shall we say. But nonetheless, it was testimony to how much money was being thrown around. You could, you know, do this. It was a lot of people, and they did exactly the same thing with Honduras. And we can go back to 1953 in Iran when they had gangs fill the streets uh, in Tehran and others to justify the overthrow of the government of Prime Minister Mitterrand, uh, Prime Mr. Minister Mossadegh, and his replacement by General Zahidi, a World War II Nazi collaborator, and of course the Shah back in power, and the Sabak being set up as the secret police, and carving up all the oil. And it had been on, completely controlled by an Anglo-Iranian oil company, now known as, now known as BP, but when Mossadegh had nationalized it, they wanted to take it all back, and, but now, since Mossadegh kicked out all the British diplomats, so-called diplomats, <coughs> in the country, so they couldn't run the coup, so they had to call on the CIA to do it, and so Kermit Roosevelt ran the coup for the CIA. But as a result, it wasn't just Anglo-Iranian or BP didn't get all the oil back. They got a large part of it, but a, a, a part of it also went to three American oil companies, one of which was Gulf, which is now, of course, part of Chevron. In 1960, Kermit Roosevelt became vice president of Gulf Oil in charge of their Washington operations. This was clearly somebody who knew how to get things done in Washington when something really dirty needed doing. The following year, in 54, they pulled the same coup in, in Guatemala against the democratic government of Jacob Arbenz. And in that case, everybody in the Eisenhower administration, virtually, it was packed to the rafters with United Fruit Company representatives. The Secretary of State, John Foster Dulles, was a lawyer for United Fruit Company at Sullivan and Cromwell Wall Street Law Firm here in New York. Um, before he became Secretary of State. Uh, his brother, Alan Dulles, was also a lawyer for United Fruit at the same law firm, Sullivan and Cromwell, before he became CIA director. The Assistant Secretary of State for Inter-American Affairs, Sproul Braden, was, the, was on the board of directors of United Fruit Company. Um, Henry Cabot Lodge, who was a major shareholder in United Fruit, was the, as chair of the UN Security Council that month, when the month they pulled the coup, he held off any discussion of the plan of the operations until uh, they had time to fly somebody up in the new puppet government to fly them up from Guatemala City to come to the UN and say, no, we're perfectly happy, we got rid of the communists and, and everything's fine now and so on. Um, and he was a major shareholder. Virtually everybody else in the government, with the exception of Eisenhower and Nixon themselves, but everybody else were United Fruit Company representatives. They've changed their name, of course, now they're Chiquita, they've changed their name repeatedly because of the opprobrium attached to that coup. But these things happen over and over again. They fill the streets with a big crowd. They claim that this somehow trumps the last election results. They did it in Ukraine, most recently in Honduras in 2009, Ukraine in 20, what, 2015. Um, they've done it in Thailand. They fill the streets with the crowd. They pull off a military coup. They've done that twice in Thailand. And they claim that that somehow overcomes the election results. And when they finally hold another election, the left is swept back into power in a, in, in a huge landslide. They did it in, in Venezuela in, 20, in 2002. Exactly the same thing. Fill the streets with a big crowd, claim that that somehow overcomes the last election results. Now, you know, in, in the early, let me just one, thing, one little thing here. In the early, in the late 60s and early 70s, we had huge demonstrations in this country against the war in Vietnam and against Nixon in particular. And yet Nixon went on to win the next election in a landslide, just as Chavez did, just as the, the left did in, in, in Thailand. So these, the idea that you can hold these, uh, fill the streets with big crowds like Lincoln Gordon, the American ambassador to Brazil, had, had hired, um, and somehow that overrules the election results, has now been a favorite routine that they keep running. But anyway, sorry. I just want to say, you could probably go on for hours. <laughs> you know, you feel that's fascinating, right? Isn't yeah. it fascinating it is and the connections and mm -hmm. the history mm -hmm. and obviously you're a Latin American scholar. <clears throat> what? You're obviously a Latin American scholar in particular. Well, in that so, yeah, partly, yeah, but it, I mean so it's, it's it's a wealth a wealth of information and also people don't remember those histories. It's very hard to, you know, all of that some of us may remember part of it, but not all of it. And when you put it all together like that, the United States control of Latin America mm -hmm. is pretty total <laughs> and multifaceted, and they have so many tricks. And uh, before you came, <clears throat> I mean, earlier when I was presenting, I, to me, the most profound um, lesson of this particular trip to Venezuela was what a challenge we face in terms of uh, what Fidel said was the media, the corporate media's control 
mm -hmm. of world of the world's consciousness of the people of the world's consciousness and you know when we talk about all the, these things that happened if people don't know it's like if the free if the tree falls and nobody hears it did it fall so <clears throat> what all these things that have happened you know when we talk about it so few people know about this or understand it and so many people fell for the bullshit about Venezuela I, I keep saying this Juan Gonzalez ma'am who is a knowledgeable Latin American person with a long history of acti activism when he talks about Venezuela <clears throat> he still says I mean I heard him say this probably about two months ago mm -hmm. where he says well of course something I can't remember how he put it about Maduro of course look, he's a dictator so accepting that language and it's as though Juan Gonzalez knows better so I think people in order to have credibility in this country often have to repeat this exactly. bullshit and these lies if you come back if I come back from Venezuela and I go to a crowd in, uh, in the United States and say oh Maduro was so inspiring <laughs> people <laughs> lock me up uh -huh. they'll do what they did with Ezra Pound put me in a mental <laughs> hospital I mean this woman says Maduro you know is so people buy into it and are it's not even it buying into it the level of mind control is such a challenge to all of us I think about it a lot I mean we quite a few of us in this room have been educators or have been involved in teaching and I remember like day after day coming in when I was teaching college coming in with newspaper articles and trying to help students see the reality this is not what's happening or I remember with high school kids bringing in six different newspapers and saying look look at the different headlines so what you read isn't necessarily true right I mean if each newspaper is telling a different story and that's an improvement of all I'm telling the same story yeah, yeah. <laughs> you know? which is usually what happens yeah so anyway we well, have one thing on that challenge. I mentioned this the other night on Venezuela on television I don't know how this was received but I said um, two years, two, three years ago, Venezuela was untouchable. Amy Goodman and Democracy Now! wouldn't even, I talked to her about it a few times, about doing something on Venezuela, wouldn't touch it. Wouldn't do it, we wouldn't all tried, it. but yeah. people tried. Over yeah, and, and yet, if you think back, and I mentioned these two examples, when, when Obama took office, they made Medicare for all completely untouchable. It was just pushed off the table, wasn't even allowed to be any discussion of it. Now, virtually every one of the candidates for president has to be in supporting it. The same with um, uh, gay marriage. Again, you couldn't, it was uh, Hillary Clinton was going against it, everybody was, you know, you, you couldn't touch that. And then by 2016, she was being faulted for having, you know, Anderson Cooper said, Are you, you'll say anything just to get elected, now you shift your positions on these things and so on. So, what we need to do, I think, is to try to create space just on the gay marriage one. When I remember some progressive members of Congress were saying, you've got to create the political space for us to be able to say this. Now, if we can create the political space for people who are, you know, supporters sort of on the left to be able to say these things and then move on from there to create a situation where they, where even the Joe Bidens of the world, the Hillary Clintons of the world, have to say it, um, or they won't get anywhere. If we can create that about Venezuela, as, as we have done with Medicare for All and, and, and gay marriage, then we will have, I mean, we needn't concentrate so much on which one of these scoundrels should be, be supporting for, for president. We need to build a political movement that creates the space where they all have to be supporting these positions. Well, right now, think about just six months ago, even in the left, even in the left, the, the bullshit that was put out about Venezuela was shocking. And you know, the Guardian and, and NACLA put out stuff denouncing yeah. Venezuela. I mean, <clears throat> and things have changed. Things have changed. I mean, they're not great, but they're definitely better now than just six months ago. So I don't know exactly how we created that space or the Venezuelans created that space. But it definitely, I think you're absolutely right, that the question of creating space for the truth to come out somewhere is really a strategic issue. And, and it works in different ways. It works in different ways. You know, they're different. There's not, there's not a formula.
how to do it. There really isn't a formula. But something like the housing that, 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 that Venezuela, in the midst of all this crisis, building, that's what is going on building Two so point six million houses, and, and with plans to build five million is, is really quite impressive. Yeah, yes. that's so the kind people, of thing we should be able to yeah, do. Yeah, and that and to show that 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 is happening in Venezuela, despite what they are saying about this, people suffering and starving and all that, some of which is true, but not to 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 say that people from all over the world were coming and saying Venezuela is a model on housing issue. I don't know if you remember at the conference. No. They were saying one after another from other countries saying. Venezuela is a model for the whole world. Yeah, and That's what the United States doesn't want to hear. Well, you're not going to hear it here. Anyway, I want to thank you for yeah. coming. Just, just one question. Do you see, you I just have a quick flying question. Flying from Venezuela One quick yesterday. question. The role of social media, do you think the role of social media is important in trying to counter the mainstream media lies? I think it is, but I, I, our rulers have obviously, you know, gotten the, they're very tight on this. We see the kind of lies that were being turned out. It's just about, for example, the whole issue of the, of, of the lies about human rights violations and so on. They can put out any kind of story. We saw it in, both in Venezuela and in Nicaragua this last year. And most of it was a pack of lies, but it, it would be churned out and people would believe it. And they have a huge staff of people making up these lies. And, but social media, I think, does have a chance. We need to just be more onto it and building out of it. But they're also, they've got a large, people, a num large number of people on salary whose job it is to, to manufacture these lies. So we have to be aware of that as well. But you're right, social media has an opportunity to, to, to respond to a lot of this stuff. Yeah, definitely. If we can do it, yeah. There are some good Thank sources you. or articles or websites. Sorry? Good sources of information, right. articles, websites. <laughs> I mean, I, I, oh, good websites or well, I mean, fair, 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 fair does fair. some very good work. They have done some good work. Uh, Covert Action Magazine also does some good work. But but fair has been quite good on, on a lot of these issues. And I was surprised that one article that I did was shared like 20. Jim Narik is the editor said this has been shared 25,000 times, and I said, is that a lot or a little? Means that that's incredible. A thousand would be great. Twenty-five thousand now it's up to like twenty-six thousand something. Like that. But it the fact that that's going on like this long after it's been off the pe front page or even the fifth page of, of fairs listings is an indication that there's a real hunger yeah. for information really want to take that people really want to know. They don't really trust the lies that they see in the media, but they don't really know what parts of it are true and what aren't. Are you available to speak? Yeah, I'd be happy to. Oh, people great. want to do it. Yeah. yeah. Again, a couple of years ago, I was up at was up at Cornell, and I contacted the Committee on U.S. Latin American Relations, which is a student group along for a long time. And I said, I could, just got back from Venezuela. I could speak on this. No, they didn't. They didn't want to touch it. Now they will. Now they're open. You know, so. I'm curious why um, why uh, democracy now said it wouldn't touch it. They didn't actually say. They they just looked uneasy and hesitant, and I think they just felt that it was too hot a potato, and that, that and I mean, of course, they're accused of taking money from Soros and everything else, but but then that may be part of it. But the real thing is what the space that they have chosen for themselves or allowed to, or has been permitted to them, that the sort of respectable position that they have. Um, carries with it some so, limits, and you know they and you can take they they may feel that they can't go beyond that, and Nicaragua the same, and so, they've had on on Nicaragua for example they've had um, Alejandro Bendano on repeatedly where they played the same tape of him over and over again denouncing the Ortega government without bothering to por point out that Alejandro Bendano has an acrimonious relationship with Daniel Ortega having nothing to do with the uh, the, the politics. Of anything, but along as a family issue, long, long predating that, um, and when at a time when Ortega was out of office, and but she hasn't mentioned that, and maybe she doesn't know it. I don't know. But the the fact that um, they will have people, and Noam Chomsky has denounced uh, Daniel Ortega's government as uh, autocratic and authoritarian, and so on, on the show. And I don't, and I think probably was talked to by Alejandro Mendana, who was hung out in Boston a long, for a long time. Um, Maybe that's why. Maybe they feel that uh, some some of this some part of this must be true or something like that. No. I'm not saying that everything in Venezuela is perfect, but they certainly have maintained a much larger range of human, civil liberties and, and, and human rights than anybody else has done. So this is this is in a, uh, a question about your opinion. Um, what used to be the fourth estate is now just a wing of uh, corporate estates. I guess it always was. Um, 
Okay, okay, okay. But at least I think there were some ideological reasons within the journalists themselves why they might be biased one way or another. Now I think it's just more, um, more of corporate mandate. Um, your opinion. Is independent media slowly being eroded and co-opted by uh, major corporations? Maybe so. Maybe that's the point that with democracy now, I mean, to some degree that may be the issue. They have a large staff. I mean, I know the people who work there. Um, in the old days, they would have had maybe two or three people who wouldn't have had the time to you know, put together a, a, a report every morning. Amy Goodman has been fantastic. She's been on that show. I don't think she's missed a morning in all these years. Right. It's amazing that she can do this and that they come out with a crackerjack, you know, kind of show every day, which, you know, if in the old days when she had the morning show on WBAI, they didn't have the staff to be able to do that kind of thing. Once you have a large number of people on the payroll, then you can do that. But as you suggest, it comes with a real... Yeah, and I don't, yeah. I don't want to just mm -hmm. focus on democracy now, right. but it seems mm -hmm. like uh, free speech TV uh, is becoming um, homogenized almost, mm -hmm. that there is a, a singular uh, type voice or type message coming from it that uh, uh, independent is, it, you know, independent media has many ideas and many voices and this is becoming sort of similar programming when you look at like Hartman and Flanders and you know mm -hmm. just the whole uh, thing and I'm wondering what is your thinking about those two because I'd be interested to know what you thought what do you think about I, those? I, uh, I respect them all sort of. Mm -hmm. Uh, no, uh, I think those two are good. I, 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 I haven't think they're all good. To know, I think yeah. Amy is good. I think Laura Flanders is good. I think Tom Hartman is good. Um, however, I think it's different faces of the same voice sometimes. And I, and I think uh, uh, certain issues like Palestine, like Venezuela, like things that are um, front and center from the uh, core masses of the left right. that are underrepresented by those voices and you would think an organization that's supposed to represent left voices not um, individual uh, uh, news people or, or organizations but left voices would have more representation of left voices 